Chapter 10 System Restore Chiaki drifted through the next few days as if dreaming. Only if she was asleep, she could actually wake up. This, this state of emptiness, guilt, and sorrow wasn't ending. The world had taken on a hazy, ash-gray tinge. It didn't seem quite real. Kamakura couldn't have given her medicine for her mood, but Chiaki had yet to notice a difference. Sometimes she felt so awful, she just wanted to curl up in her bed and lie there like a useless lump. Progress on her physical therapy had ground to almost a complete halt. She just couldn't seem to muster up the energy to put actual effort into it. The mental-emotional therapy wasn't much different. She'd talk for maybe a few minutes, then clam up. Such as now. Recount what happened. I don't see the point. You already know what happened. Probably better than me. Kamakura-kun's eyes were like stones, flat, hard, and unamused. I know what happened from my perspective. Tell me what happened from yours. Chiaki shuffled a foot against the tatami, shifting in her seat. She'd thought the imagery of sit down and tell me how you feel, was just a silly stereotype. And while this wasn't quite the same, it was close enough. Her on her bed, Kamakura sitting in his chair, knee up. This wasn't the first time they reached this kind of stalemate. At the therapy sessions, Kamakura-kun would sit her down and ask her to tell him everything that happened. But she could never bring herself to. Every time she tried, it was as if she was transported back and she'd shake and sweat, and it was just so awful. She could talk about a few events, but not the entire thing. Then he'd push her to say how it made her felt, and she would always lie and say she was fine. But in truth, her dreams had morphed into nightmares. She would run through that endless maze, and each wrong turn would bring her before a red-eyed classmate. Sometimes Hinata-kun was there too, staring at her accusingly, blood dripping from a crown of cuts on his head. She'd turn and try to run, but they'd follow her, steadily increasing into a mob. The words they flung physically manifested as blades and darts, nicking and stabbing her until she woke up. You were supposed to protect us! You should have done better! We would have been better off without you. I needed help, and you didn't notice. Sometimes, she wanted to shout at Kamakura-kun to stop trying to help her. She wasn't worth helping, and it was irritating that he wouldn't just leave her alone. Why did he even care about her? She couldn't do anything right. She'd just disappoint him in the end. And then, sometimes she wanted to shout at him for not trying hard enough. Because she felt so alone, and Kamakura-kun, all he did was watch. When they weren't in therapy, he let her be. He didn't try to intrude on her space, and rather than appreciating it, it annoyed her. He only ever asked about her health in a clinical manner, as if she were some interesting specimen in a lab that was misbehaving. Maybe that was all she was to him. Maybe she was just deluding herself when she thought he actually cared, at least in the way a normal person did. Then she'd swing around to being guilty again. Hadn't he done enough for her? What did it matter whether he actually cared or not? She shouldn't ask any more of him. It wasn't his fault she was such an emotional, needy mess. It was all hers. It was a ceaseless cycle A whirling maelstrom of misery, anger, guilt, misery. And at its core was the memory she'd regained. The central belief that she didn't deserve to live. But... I don't don't want want to to die. die. She didn't deserve to live. But she was too scared to die. And she knew from experience that Kamakura-kun wouldn't let the therapy session end until she'd said something. So, she gingerly spoke, in a faltering tone, with lots of pauses, trying to abbreviate as much as possible. Komaeda-kun and I were looking for Sumiki-san. We went down a secret tunnel and found Mitarai-kun. 
who she now remembered was the real Mitarai, the one she'd known and befriended, had been the ultimate imposter. He kept shaking and repeating, It's not my fault. Then, eh, Enoshima showed up. Just saying the name brought back the saunter in that girl's steps, the cold flash of her blue eyes, the bruising grip on Chiaki's chin. Unconsciously, she started to tremble. Kamaida-kun pulled out a gun. You took it and shot him, and we stared at each other for a bit. I recognized you. You asked who I was, then Enoshima... Chiaki realized there was pressure building behind her eyes and in her chest. She forced it back and swallowed, feeling nauseous. I... I can't. Not anymore, Kamakura-kun. He was silent for a moment. Very well. He finally acquiesced, and Chiaki could have sobbed in relief. Something similar to apprehension shadowed his face for half a second. Do you wish to play video games today? She shook her head. No, not now. I'll just take a nap. Maybe later. A lie. They both knew it. But he didn't call her on it, just stared long and hard. Then he slightly canted his head up and rose from his chair. Chiaki always waited until he'd left her room to cry. It was why she'd insisted on holding the therapies there in the first place. She knew she wouldn't be able to get away fast enough. Here, she could just bury her face in her pillow and let the tears out as soon as the door closed. Plus, her bed was conveniently right there so she could go back to sleep once she was done. That was all she wanted to do now. It was too tiring to stay awake, and even the nightmares were better than the nasty, awful feelings constantly hanging over her. Izuru had been in a state of unrest lately. It had been exactly one week since he'd begun emotional and mental therapy for her, and Nanami was barely eating. She was not speaking. She slept too much. She rarely left her room, and she often gazed sightlessly at the walls. Her demeanor shifted between irritability, sorrow, and listlessness, a sign of hormonal imbalance. He'd analyzed all her behavioral patterns and concluded that Nanami was plagued by a combination of post-traumatic stress disorder, survivor's guilt, and depression. She'd been putting on a show of being fine in a feeble attempt to get him to stop the therapy and leave her alone, but it was easy to see through for him. Her conduct was not unusual. Many people with such traumas felt like they were, quote-unquote, burdening others, but irksome. Did she not realize how damaging it was to her own health to neglect herself this way? The most alarming sign was that she didn't touch her video games anymore. He had never seen a day go by where she didn't play them since he first made them available to her. Yet every time he offered, encourage, encourage patients, patients with, with depression, depression to partake in their, in their hobbies. hobbies, she refused. And even more troubling, he quietly looked at the Game Girl Advance in his hands. When he'd returned to Nanami's room with her meal the day she regained her memories, he'd immediately spotted it in pieces on the floor. It had been an intriguing, but worrisome sight. He'd pretended he hadn't noticed and swiped it while she was poking at her food. Fixing it wasn't a problem, but the fact that she had broken it at all? It was concerning to him. He wasn't sure whether to welcome this sudden change or not. He slid the console back into his pocket. Loath as he was to admit it, he could understand Enoshima a little better now. He could understand her drive to push Matsuda into despair before killing him. After all, despair was showing a new side of Nanami, one he hadn't seen before, one as captivating as her other sides. He would never have predicted that she'd break one of her beloved consoles after all, and yet, in her despair, she had. <laughs> 
It was fascinating, and he almost wanted to see more. A vague part of him recognized and acknowledged that this would repulse an ordinary person, but Kamakura Izuru was beyond the ordinary. He was a superhuman with a superhuman way of looking at things. He was not blind to the parallels between himself and Inoshima either. Their genius intellect, their mutual boredom, their desire to alleviate it by whatever means necessary. But the stark difference between him and the ultimate despair was, while he did find Nanami's misery interesting, he did not like it. He did not like the ugly dullness in her pink irises, the dark shadows under her eyes from stress, the limpness of her hair. It physically hurt him, it was hurting her, and he did not like it! That alone was interesting, that he could dislike something that held his attention. But he truly did not value despair enough to leave Nanami floundering in it. Thus, his attempts to apply cognitive therapy. Mental therapy sessions began after lunch. Today, he began the session like he always did. Tell me what happened. Izuru could tell Nanami was feeling better than usual today. Her posture was slightly relaxed, and she'd actually eaten most of her sandwich. Using that, he predicted that Nanami would speak more than usual before shutting down. He was right, of course. She managed to get to where she was rallying her classmates before having to stop. And then Komaiiri kun said... She cut herself off, looking away sharply. I don't want to keep talking. For the past seven days, Izuru had accepted that. But today, he could sense a breakthrough was imminent, and so he pushed. You must. Recounting it in your own words will gradually lessen the pain it has on you. Additionally... Knowing what was around you at the time will be helpful in discovering any triggers you may have. It is vital for you to understand. Anger flared fast and sudden on her face. I don't need to understand it. It was awful. End of story. It is very illogical to ignore facts, especially ones pertaining to your well-being. It serves no purpose and only makes recovery harder. She turned her head away. Nanami, I cannot help you if you do not let me. I don't want help. She grumbled. Why do you say that? Her eyes were starting to water. I just don't, okay? Can you leave me alone? No, tell me why. Because I let my friends down. I failed to protect them. So I don't deserve to be here or to ask for help. She shrieked, tears spilling over her cheeks as she leapt to her feet. It was like a dam had broken. Her face completely crumpled, and the girl curled into herself, burying her face in her hands. And for the first time in a very long while, Izuru found himself caught off guard. Not because he hadn't predicted the possibility of her breaking down in tears, but because... He had failed to calculate his reaction to it. The sight of her tears dropped a heavy weight onto his chest, not unlike what he'd experienced when he first saw her bleeding out, and it threw off all calculations his mind was attempting to make. Quite simply, he had a desire to do something, and no idea what it should be. He searched his memories for anything that might offer guidance in this situation. There was nothing... He had only once shed tears, alone and away from company, and he had quickly collected himself. He had never needed comfort, or been obliged to offer it. But then, recollection. Enoshima sniffling and rubbing her eyes in exaggerated weeping. You know, this is the part where you're supposed to hold me close as I cry into your chest about my lost love. 